For every animal, the name of the game is survival. The rules are simple. Find food and drink. Find shelter and avoid predators and hostile environments. Those who are best equipped to survive and who manage to mate will pass on their genes to the next generation. This is the true meaning of survival of the fittest. Fortunately, nature lends a helping hand. It provides animals with a set of built-in, inherited skills that function at birth or shortly thereafter. These skills are called reflexes. Some reflexes, like sucking, provide necessary biological supports. Other reflexes are ready-made, swift, and simple reactions to stimuli that pose a potential threat. And nature also provides more complex patterns of reaction, known as fixed action patterns. For example, the annual upstream journey of salmon to spawning grounds. These are sequences of actions triggered automatically by particular environmental and biological events and performed in the same way by every member of a species. These birds will migrate to the same destination at the same time of every year. When we take a look at animals that are more evolved, we find their behavior is less the replaying of the same old song and more a series of variations from individual to individual. The behavior of these animals is more adaptive to changing circumstances because of their capacity for learning. Learning is the way that a species profits from its experience. It's the mechanism by which past experience guides future behavior. This is true for humans as well as other animals. For humans, learning covers a wide range of activities, from acquiring a different language to studying in school. From playing sports to playing the flute. In the process of learning, an individual's behavior is modified. He or she acquires new habits and new ideas are put into practice. Can you mix up all these dry ingredients very carefully, very slowly and carefully, okay? Now while you're doing that, we need a cup of... The new behavior can change the environment itself, making it more conducive to the individual's well-being. Yeah, pretty good, Joshua. Learning allows us to do two important things in the quest for survival. First, to anticipate the future from past experience. And second, to control a complex and ever-changing environment. Traditionally, learning has been studied in laboratories like this one, using animals as subjects. In part, because it's easier to conduct controlled experiments with animals than it is with humans. And also because animals are like humans in important ways. As a result, behavioral psychologists have come up with new views, not only of animal behavior, but of human nature as well. And these views all concern a process that we take for granted, learning. Because we are all truly born to learn. Ironically, one of the most important figures in the study of learning, Ivan Pavlov, wasn't concerned with the subject at all, at least not at first. Pavlov, a noted Russian scientist, won the Nobel Prize for Physiology and Medicine in 1904. As this original footage shows, Pavlov was initially interested in digestion and the action of the salivary glands. By diverting the saliva of dogs into test tubes, he could precisely measure if and how much they salivated during digestion. When food was presented, the dog salivated quickly, an inherited salivary reflex. But over repeated testings, a strange thing happened. 
the dog salivated before contact with the food. Just the sight of the food was enough to stimulate their drooling. Then, just seeing the food dish, or even hearing the footsteps of Pavlov or his assistants, was enough to trigger this built-in reflex. What was going on to elicit this response? Pavlov decided to find out by systematically varying the stimuli and measuring the dog's reaction. Metronomes, lights, and bells were all used as stimuli, and they all worked as stand-ins for the food. What mattered was not the kind of stimulus that was used, but the fact that it reliably signaled that food was on the way. Pavlov had discovered a fundamental type of learning called classical conditioning. An original stimulus elicits an automatic, unlearned response. Both stimulus and response happen naturally. They are unconditioned. Then a second, neutral stimulus that never elicits the unconditioned response by itself is introduced just before the presentation of the original stimulus. If the neutral or signaling stimulus is presented alone, and response occurs as if the original stimulus were still there, we say that conditioning has taken place. The arbitrary neutral stimulus becomes a conditioned stimulus. The reverse is also true. Pavlov and others studied the extinction over time of such conditioned responses. When the subject learns that the conditioned stimulus no longer signals a desired event, the acquisition process is reversed, as the learned connection is gradually weakened. Pavlov's work, and the work of those who followed him, led to a remarkable conclusion. And that is, any stimulus an organism can perceive is capable of eliciting any reaction the organism is capable of making. This means that virtually any sound, sight, or smell can influence the way our muscles tense or relax, our moods fluctuate, or even the way our attitudes are formed. For instance, if I say, relax, and then do this, you're going to be startled and upset. After five or six pairings of, relax, just saying the word, relax, is going to generate a negative response rather than its usual learned reaction.